Well, in the world that you and I live in, people want to talk about truth. They talk about justice. They talk about getting down to the bottom of things. Let's launch an investigation. Let's find out what really happened. Well, listen, we're going to do that today in our study, revealing truth. Listen, revealing truth from the inside out. You see, Jack, what does that mean? According to God's word, this is what the law was intended to do. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, for example, the law of God. God's law was given to us, according to Moses, that it might show us where we fail. Yes, the law of God is awesome and spectacular, and it is those guardrails to keep us in line. However, none of us, starting with me, are perfect. But the Apostle Paul, before he knew the Lord Jesus Christ, he thought that he had kept the law. But what happened was when he began to understand the law, truth was revealed to him from the inside out. Outwardly, Paul looked fantastic. He saw himself keeping the first commandment, the second commandment, the third commandment. He put himself and his morality, maybe you're like this, up against the rules and regulations or laws. And you say, boy, aren't I good. But listen, when you put yourself up against God's truth, something happens from the inside out God kind of guts you with his truth. And what happened was Paul got to the commandment that said, thou shalt not covet, and that got him. It nailed him. Trust me, my friend, the Ten Commandments have been designed to point you to Jesus. Not to salvation of the commandments, by the commandments, no, but to Jesus. The law points you to Jesus. Jesus rescues you from the law. This is very key. So grab your Bibles, open them up, and let's dive into what God's Word is saying to us about revealing truth from the inside out. Mark Twain said that a lie goes around the world twice before the truth ever gets its shoes on. But don't worry, don't worry for truth. Truth will always prevail in the end. Everybody needs to know this. Here's a fact for you. Lies will always, always be exposed. If not in this life, in the day of judgment and the life to come. Lies will fail. A life of deception and, and mirrors and smoke, as it were, to deceive or to trick or to portray something else will always fail. The truth is revealing. God's truth gets at you. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. That's what got Paul. That's what got him. It's absolutely remarkable. What's he referring to? Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Mark it down. Exodus 20, verse 17 Here's what God said. This is, on, this is uh, on the stone tablets, right? Uh, this is number 10, by the way. It's interesting. So there's a reason why Paul didn't mention the second commandment or the seventh. Paul, what got Paul, listen, because what gets you might be different. It, uh, God's law got Paul at number 10. There's suggestions, we can't prove it, but Paul's religious activity may have led him to believe this. Deceived, but led him to believe this. Number one, first commandment, I got that. I love God with all my heart. Second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment, fifth commandment, I got those. He's good. Something happened that, imagine, yeah, eight, woohoo! Nine, I'm, can you imagine just getting right to the edge? You're like half an inch from scoring. And then number 10 is revealed. What'd you say? Number 10, what is it? Thou shalt not covet. And you can hear his self-righteous breaks slam and skid marks happening. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Something we know about Paul. This was his problem. This is what got him. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or husband, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, that would be pickup truck, <laughs> F-150 something, I don't know, nor his donkey, that would be his sports car, <laughs> nor anything that is your neighbor's. Looking over the fence, oh, honey, did you know that they got a new lawnmower? <laughs> How old is our lawnmower? Have you noticed our world is, is set for this? Number 10, if number one doesn't get you, and you should be, we should all be busted at number one. It's gonna come back and get you again at number 10. These two bookends of the law, the 10 commandments, they just gonna squeeze you into confession. And what's the confession? I can't do it. That's what the commandments are for. They're perfect. And I got a problem. Because on the outside, you can't tell if I'm coveting. Look, right now, look at me, right now. I'm standing here. You can't tell if I'm coveting or not. Can you? But God knows. All of a sudden, that just blows up. The religious performance of an individual is, what are you saying? I'm saying it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. God knows what you're thinking on the inside. You know, listen, anybody use this term anymore, keeping up with the Joneses? Joneses, you ever heard that? We've got to keep up with the Joneses. For, for, the, for a part of this crowd, that means, uh, oh, he got a new car, we've got to get a new car. Oh, uh, they, they, they got a new house, we've got to get a new house. It's called keeping up with the Joneses. For young people, I don't know what it would be today. He got the iPhone 13, no, he's got to get iPhone 14. It's like, wait, what is that? You were doing fine until you saw something different that someone else had, and you went, hmm. That is so dangerous that it's number 10, and the number 10 is very close to the number one because it just comes back around. And to fail at number 10 is to fail at all of them because to fail at 10 is to fail at one, and you shall have no other God before me. And when you sit back and you go, mm, I want one of those really bad. Have you noticed how rotten, stinking, worthless your car is now? <laughs> In all the TV commercials? All of our cars are worthless. I don't care what you just bought. According to Lexus, your car stinks. You got to get a Lexus if you're going to be somebody. And those clothes you've been wearing, what's wrong with you? You don't have any trees, but you'll buy a chainsaw because it's being pitched. <laughs> And you'll say, wait a minute, we need to get one of those. But honey, we have no trees. <laughs> what is going on? Truth reveals us from the inside out. And what happens when it goes out, it strikes us. And Paul's failure realized, because we've all failed all the Ten Commandments, every single one of them. Because God sees your mind. He sees your desires. He sees what you're pondering and, and what? Imagining. And um, we're guilty. And for Paul, it was this one of covetousness. And he was left, as it were, spiritually bleeding, in a sense. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Galatians 3, 21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been, listen, a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Stop right there, everybody. This is amazing. Verse 21. If you could get to heaven by keeping rules and regulations and being a super person, then Jesus wasted his time at the cross. If you could get there by keeping verse 21, the law, here in Galatians 3.21 then God made a big mistake. <laughs> All of his prophets are wrong, and his apostles died in vain. But most importantly, Jesus wasted his time on the cross if you can keep the law. And this is very offensive to some friends of ours because they think they're keeping the law right now. Verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin 
that the promise by faith, here it is, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ or faith in Messiah might be given to those who believe. That's it. The law is out here. To those who believe is when God takes it and writes it on the inside of your heart. You don't look at the rules to see what you keep. God puts the rules in your heart and says, I'm going to do this through you. You you don't have the power to do this, Jack, but my spirit inside of you as a believer, he'll take over from here. I'm going to make a statement. It's going to sound crazy. It's 100% true. You can be the most religious, line item keeping religionist known to man. But the born again believer, follower of Jesus Christ, is more right with God than you'll ever be. Why? Because if you're going by the rules, God's on the outside. If your life has put faith in Christ, then God's doing it all from the inside. And that's all the difference in time and eternity. Listen, mark this down if you would. Just when you thought it was over, reality strikes you at the heart. And it does so when reality awakens you to yourself. That's what reality does, friends. Listen. The Bible says in verse 8, but sin taking opportunity, listen to this, it almost like it personifies sin. Think about it, like a thief. But the thief taking an opportunity, now watch, by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Leave this on the screen for a second. Are you guys still with me? I need you to, okay, watch this. Again, remember, Paul was being accused of teaching people wrong doctrine because the Judaizers said that he taught this faith thing in Jesus, in the merits of Jesus, and it didn't do anything. We have our critics today. Oh, you believers. Somebody told me recently, um, I, I, suppose you want every, I suppose you want everybody to believe in your religion. And my answer to the guy was, nope. No, I don't. Let's be honest, first of all. That's not going to work. Number two, God didn't say that's how it's going to turn out. But the most important thing is, we're not talking about religion. You can't join. But sin. You circle the word sin, and it means to miss the mark of perfection. If you're shooting arrows, it's to miss the bullseye. The strange thing about this word sin is that great scholars throughout millennia have tried to get a definition. We can define the word. It means to miss the mark, but the origins of sin are are cloudy and shrouded. What's cool about that truth is that It wasn't supposed to be this way. That's why it's hard for us to grasp. See, what do you mean? Well, the first thing that we know about sin is that it was in the heart of Satan. Read later Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28. It will blow your mind about Satan. Lucifer, he was called back then. It was in him. Now, you might want to mark this down. Humans and angels, according to the Bible, have been given... A will. A will. The ability to choose and to decide willfully. It's built in. God built that into us. So the Bible tells us that Lucifer said in the day that pride was found in his heart. Pride is sin. Probably the greatest of all sin. If you could rate sin. He said, I want to be like God. I want to have my throne above his. I want the angelic host to worship me. This is what Lucifer said. Read those chapters I told you a moment ago. The Bible says, for his sin of pride, he was cast out. He fell. Do you know what that is? Covetousness. He couldn't have wanted a throne greater than God's throne unless he had seen God's throne and realized, I want that. Do you see that? He looked over the fence and said, I want angels to worship me. And the Bible says, we don't know the number, but the Bible says he deceived one-third of the angelic hosts. 
We don't have any idea what that number is. It's just one third. Covetousness. How about this? This is co covetousness. Um, you know, you're talking a lot about sin and you're gonna be talking more about that verse here in a minute and all that stuff. And well, I agree with you, Pastor Jack. There's a whole lot of sinners in here. So I'll just tune out and come back next week at the Christmas message. You know what? That's the sin of Satan. It doesn't matter, apparently, if you're a human or an angel. When you take your will and you supersede that of God with your will, that is coveting a state or a position that is not intended to be us, yours. When somebody thinks there's something, it's sickening. Isn't it sickening to see someone all puffed up with pride? And yet that is a gross manifestation of Satan's heart. Remarkable. So back to that verse eight, look, look at it on the screen, verse eight. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment. So watch how this, let's un unpack this, but sin, there it is. Or, uh, origin, originates in Satan, he takes it and reproduces it because he knows it worked against him. He reproduces it in the Garden of Eden to Eve. Eve, just peek over the fence and see God's holding out on you. You can have a throne too. You can be like God. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. But sin taking opportunity. So notice, sin takes the opportunity. How does it do that? How does sin have power to take advantage of us? The commandment. Oh, then the commandment's wrong. No, the commandment's perfect. Here is the point. God's commandment is perfect, but God's commandment doesn't tolerate sin. But sin exists. So God's commandment does this. Look what I'm doing to you. I know it's not polite, but you'll forgive me in advance. See what I'm doing? Don't point. Yes, I'm pointing at you and you. I'm pointing. That's what, listen, the commandment points and says, this is wrong. Sin takes advantage of that. When the commandment is like this, saying, thou shalt not, sin takes advantage of that upon our human lives. And look, we realize it produces in us all manner of evil desire. I, you and I wouldn't have known evil desire unless the commandment would have been given, thou shalt not covet. And it's like, really? I thought I was doing pretty good. Yeah, well, that's a sin for thinking like that. <laughs> but you know how you've been looking at that over there? Yeah, so I'm just looking, not touching. Sin! Well, I don't want my kids to think we growing up poor or something. So we did this, or we did that. Notice the motive. To covet. Apart from the law, sin was dead. Isn't that amazing? Who means sin was dead? The word actually means dormant, not dead, dead. Sin was dormant. Sin was held in check because there was no law that stirred up within me the conviction of desire. So, for example, if I say, whatever you guys do, don't think about pink bananas. As soon as I said that, you had a pink, you saw a pink banana right about here in your head. If, if I say, now, it's stormy outside, and the last thing you'd want to do is take a drive down to the beach today and go down Coast Highway and see the incredible crashing waves and, and all of that turbulent water, beautiful sound and all, you know, don't do it. You're already saying, honey, that's a great idea. I don't want to sit inside all day. Let's do what he just said. It's that old thing that I mentioned last week. Don't step on the grass. Which grass? This grass right here? <laughs> that is in us. That's our sin nature. And to say it doesn't exist is to deceive yourself. 
that God's commandment is given so that it might become obvious. When it becomes obvious, then we realize, whoa! And Paul woke up, and he found out that he was very, very much awakened to himself that he needed God. Man, isn't that true that when reality hits, it, it, it makes the headlines, right? Reality, when it hits, uh, it makes international news. Reality, when it hits, it causes you and I to pick up the phone and to call people. When reality strikes, when reality hits, it causes everything to be shaken to the point where we look around and grab to see what's stable. When God's reality strikes, it hits us right in the stomach. It takes our knees out. And that's by design. God's reality causes you and I in a world of so much deception and so much falsehood to come to that place where I've been believing a lie. I've been, I've been listening to things that's really a non-reality. I've been listening to things that have been leading me astray. And reality hits and it causes you and I to grab on. And when it happens, it causes you and I to experience something that might even drive us to the Bible. Somebody might even say, it's time to pray. Or somebody might even say, I'm gonna to go to church. Listen, friends, when reality strikes, I want you to know something. If, if your life right now is shaken and you don't know what to do and, and where to go, you may think that there's been some horrific accident that's taken place. And what I'm saying to you today is, God does not dwell in the realm of accidents. God may not cause all that's going on, but what he capitalizes on is what is going on. He sends messages, he sends downloads to you. He drops you the thought in the midst of your reality being shaken. Here's true reality. Here's true hope and stability. Listen, friends, right here at Real Life, we want you to know that reality through Jesus Christ. You can go to jackhibbs.com and find out more, much more, of what we have available for you to study God's Word and to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. Where did life come from? It's one of the big questions, right? Is there a creator or are we here by random accident? In his book, He Who Thinks Has to Believe, A.E. Wilder Smith takes a look at the origins of life using a unique allegory. A plane crashes in a remote corner of the earth where a group of primitive humans have existed for centuries, untouched by outside influence. When the rescue expedition encounters this unique group of people, a fascinating dialogue develops, giving rise to debate about creation and the creator. Walk the path of reason using logic and sound judgment in this intriguing one-of-a-kind book. He Who Thinks Has to Believe will be sent to you as a thank you gift for your generous donation to Real Life Ministries today. To get your copy, go to jackhibbs.com or call 877-777-2346. Order now. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effects. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it in one of the great ways. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? 
we ask that you commit to support real life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.